Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Red Lettuce. My name is Eric. I'm your host, and I am joined with a few comrades tonight. Um, I'm very happy to have all of you uh, join me in this discussion. I will let you I'll, I'll let you all do the introductions because I'm very bad at introductions. <laughs> so I will start with, let's start with Greg. Gregory, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, let us know a little more about you and where people can find you. How you doing? I'm Gregory Butler. I'm a longtime union activist and communist in New York City. I've been in the labor movement for a quarter century. I've been a communist since I was 13 years old. And you can find me on Twitter at Gregory A. Butler. It's easy to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find me on Facebook at Gregory A. Butler. Uh, I also have a blog called Gangbox News, G-A-N-G-B-O-X News, all one word. And that's probably the three easiest places to find me. And if you got questions, I'm very responsive. I will answer you. You might not like the answer though. <laughs> Yeah, we've seen that, and uh, we but we appreciate that very much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's uh, let's go with Eric. Yeah. So I'm Eric Arbor. Um, I you can find me on Twitter, whatever. Like I, I also am on Medium um, at Arbor Eric. Um, I. I've done some writing right now. I'm doing some transcriptions for Marxist.org with um, a fellow Twitter user, um, Philip Mooney. Um, I guess I'm, I am just interested in letting the American left know what it can be and showing it what it needs to stop being. <laughs> Very good. Which I guess we're all here for. Yes, we're going to get into that very shortly. Dakota. <clears throat> so my name is Dakota Lilly. Um, I, um, I've been published on Cindy Sheehan Soapbox, um, Popular Resistance, Global Research. Um, I've been featured on RT. Um, I've. My first major action was Spring Rising. It was a big anti-war demonstration in Washington, D.C. when I was 15, I believe. Um, and ever since then, I've had a particular interest in Venezuela, in Latin American mm -hmm. socialism. Uh, I think we have a lot to learn from uh, our brothers and sisters down south. Um, I think we're very close culturally, so I think their regional variant of socialism is something that we should learn about. Um, I've been to Venezuela four times since 2017. Um, I hope to go later this year, and I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. We're, we're very glad to have you. Um, I'm very glad to have all of you with me tonight to discuss uh, all the subjects that we'll be covering. So I guess we will get right into it. Um, the synthetic settler crowd likes to promote that settler, settler colonial, colonialism is the primary contradiction in America. Why is this not true? And what is petty bourgeois radicalism? And how does the synthetic settler crowd represent that definition? Who'd like to start? I guess we'll, let, let's start with Greg, Gregory. Well, the whole settler thing. Okay, uh, the problem is settler colonialism. And the solution is removing the settlers. Example. Zanzibar, British uh, protectorate of Zanzibar is a colony off the coast of Eastern Africa. It was ruled by Arab slave traders, majority of the population were black people who were descended from freed slaves. They had a revolution in 1963. The issue was the British indirectly ruled Zanzibar with the Arab slave traders. What was the solution? Well, the Zanzibaris made all the Arabs leave. How do I mean made them leave? Well, just the way you think made them leave. A lot of people got to leave permanently, put it that way. So if the problem is settler colonialism, well, the problem is remove the settlers. Well, in Zanzibar, those settlers are all from Oman, a country in the Arabian Peninsula near Saudi Arabia. There was a place they could go, and they had recent historical ties to Zanzibar. 
In fact, the dude who was the Sultan of Zanzibar was a cousin of the Sultan of Oman, the same royal family. So that's a place for them to go to. Now, as far as if the problem in America is settler colonialism, well, there's 234 million white people in America. Uh, most of them have been here a very long time. Many of them have been here hundreds of years. Where are you going to send them to? Now, I could see if you're an immigrant and you came here in your lifespan and you're from, say, Ukraine, Moldova, Ireland, Australia, yeah, he could send you back. Probably not a good idea, but it could be done. But, you know, if your family's lived there 40 years, what are they going to send you? And also, the, the logistics of deporting 234 million people, kind of a daunting task. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever deported that many people in any in a given time. And, you know, the biggest mass deportation in world history was when Hitler deported 7 million Poles from Poland to be slave laborers in Germany. Took a lot of effort. Also involved murdering a bunch of people. So it was a bad thing. It was actually a war crime. Dude who planned it, a gentleman named Hans Frank, he got executed for that, for class one war crimes. So maybe we don't want to do that. And if the problem in America is settler colonialism with people who've been here for hundreds of years, well, is that really the issue? And you're also settlers includes Warren Buffett's a settler, the guy who uh, <clears throat> installs Warren Buffett's trailers, the trailers that he sells, that's how he got to be a billionaire. He's a settler. The homeless person who ends up sleeping in the street because he can't afford to rent one of Warren Buffett's trailers. He's a settler. You have all these people who are very, are very different, let's get fancy and Marxist here, relationship to the forces of production, but they're all settlers. So is that really useful for any kind of serious political project to speak of settlers? Jay Sakai thinks so, but Jay Sakai's an idiot. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, man. That was a great breakdown. Eric, let, let's, let's move to you. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, so I mean, we've I've been on here to kind of talk similar, similar discussion mm -hmm. about uh, I guess about more about the settlers question. Um, I just find that like w when it was written, like this J. Sakai pamphlet, um, it was in an era of a certain rage and sort of anger with um, sort of complacency with the working class. They weren't embracing a sort of new communist, like a, what we would call synthetic left now. Um, and the, 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 in, anal in analyzing that, they came to the conclusion that, well, these people just must have some sort of inherent reaction. They must always be appealing to reaction of whatever uh, class traitorship, um, kind of being beholden to the bosses. Um, and I guess that that obviously is just it, the the analysis comes from a, I guess I could say it comes from a good place. Um, it just, it doesn't come up with the right conclusion. Uh, we, we could say that it has just as much class analysis as like a, a MAGA person. They, they understand that the, sh the jobs are gone. They've been gone for 30 years. But they're they're they, they 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 have a similar solution, and it's to deport a certain color of people. So it, it in many ways it, it carries the same sort of uh, reaction in, in in its in in how it kind of uh, formulates this idea. Um, I I think the way like I think Kim Moody. Um, was he was like an SDS guy. Um, he described capitalism as like pushing together and pulling apart the working class. So it, in many ways, it does force people to put, put uh, force people to work together, but it also can drive people apart because it's all about competition. You're 
betting your wage, you're, you're betting your labor for wages. You're trying to compete with other workers just to stay alive. Um, so I think that if, if we're only focusing on this pulling apart, we're going to have these same conclusions. Um, now, if we choose to kind of focus on the pushing together, how can we unite? Um, and if we, if we are interested in winning like certain reforms or achievements that would improve black and brown lives in the United States or elsewhere, um, it's hard to imagine that these things would be won without winning them for all working people. And that includes obviously the majority of working people in the United States, which are happen to be these quote settlers. Um, so it, it, if, if, uh, if we didn't do that, this is, I guess, um, Adolf Reed's uh, ish, uh, sort of contingent or um, idea within his uh, thing about the problem with disparity. Um, he, he says, a society, a society where making black and white people equal means making them equally subordinate to mainly white, but really what does that matter? Um, ruling class is not, not a more just society, just a differently unjust one. And so that, that's what he says is the, the problem with disparities. You're just creating these divisions along racial lines and not actually uplifting. I guess we could, we, I mean, we, we've discussed that regarding like constructive versus destructive or critical analyses, but that's kind of the way I would approach this, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So for me, I mean, I'm not an expert in this particular field, if, even though I've been called a settler many, <laughs> many, many times. We all have, haven't we? <laughs> it, it, uh, it, even uh, Gregory has been called uh a, a settler which is hilarious because i'm african-american and like people on twitter looking at my picture my avi is an actual photograph of me <laughs> oh you're a white guy it's like really <laughs> I think you need glasses <laughs> i mean by their logic i mean che Guevara would have been considered a settler right uh, yeah. technically well, so. i just hate whenever we have to talk about like the race of like Fidel or Che. Yeah, it's, like, just, it's, it's because it's such a waste of time, um, waste. among other things. But I mean, to me, it's a very carefully constructed way in which they've been able to continue to divide workers, you know, by putting on these certain things like settler colonialism or um, like the labor aristocracy, things like that. It's, it's ways to keep people divided. Um, you know, the Black Panther Party was very adamant that white people should form, you know, the White Panther Party to be allies of the Black Panther Party. They shouldn't be silent. They shouldn't just shut up. They shouldn't just leave. They should be active allies in the fight for liberation. Um, because again, the main distinction, obviously um, race distinction exists. So you'd have to be blind to think otherwise, in my opinion. But you know, wealthy people of all, like, and I, when I say wealthy, I mean the capitalists, owners of the means of production, super wealthy people. Um, they have much more in common with each other, regardless of race, than, um, you know, Jeff Bezos is white, but what do I have in common with Jeff Bezos besides the fact that I'm white? Nothing. You know, so to me, it's another way for them to cleverly kind of use, um, for lack of a better word, identity politics to keep people divided and to keep people fighting amongst themselves. I mean, even it's even used in an imperial context many times, like mm -hmm. as someone who, you know, uh, has talked about Venezuela and stuff like that. Many times people have said, oh, you're talking over actual Venezuelans who live in Miami. Um, you know, you're talking over the actual Cubans in Miami who have real lived experiences, which is so much more than anything in textbook, you know, even though I mean, the settler Cubans and the settler Venezuelans. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> these people are whiter than I am. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, I guess that's my two cents on the subject. Let, let's talk about what socialism with American characteristics uh, and what uh, that means. 
Um, how did previous revolutionary socialists like William Z. Foster, Gus Hall, and Huey Newton provide an example how it could take shape here in the US? And why does the synthetic left have such an aversion to it? Uh, let's start with uh, Eric on that one. Um, well, I think that what, I guess if like the way that Foster uh, ima like started to imagine it, I guess was very sort of mirrored off of uh, the way that the Soviet Union's system was. Obviously it was an inspiration for the whole world at the time. Um, it inspired the party itself to be created here. Um, but he envisioned it strong. I mean, he it is kind of formulated in, in the shadows and sort of refined in the shadows of the great steel strike of 1919. Um, of which was largely a failure because of the inability to uh, unite the working class along across racial barriers. Um, at that time, there were a lot of sharecroppers who were largely black that would be, uh, be flown in from the South or in urban areas, I guess, also um, to uh, work as scab workers. Um, and it, obviously it was, it was a good deal. I mean, why would like, if, if you were in that position, it makes no, no sense to take to offer down, offer to turn down an offer of like higher wages for a, for just for like a, a job that you may not know that much about, but still, um, but it was regardless, it was, um, they were crossing picket lines and that created obvious sentiment, uh, hostility towards, towards black workers. Um, and it, it ended up uh, from like the largely white um, unionized workers or work, uh, workers striking in the steel industry. So you, you have, you have this, the CPUSA sort of formulate this idea that you can't, you cannot, you cannot do anything in this country without uniting the working class across racial barriers. Um, this was, I think, had to have been one of the first major formulations or major kind of recognitions of this fact. And that's why the CPUSA spent a lot of time working towards not only unionizing, organizing um, along major like industrial areas, but also in areas such as like in the sharecropping South, um, uniting uh, I mean, they're, they're obvious, like we, a lot of us know of the um, motto, black, white, black, white, unite and fight. Um, so this was a, they were, they were the first to sort of fight against, um, fight against lynch, like lynching as a form of ex, extrajudicial punishment and uh, murder. Um, the, like the way that the CPUSA formulated it is that like class unity only comes through as well racial and and cl or class struggle is in, in itself like multiracial in this country um and so i think that that's what like and obviously gus hall elaborated on that as as conditions developed throughout the 20th century um huey newton uh, sort of proposes this idea of intercommunalism. He he formulates that as um, I guess prior to prior to it, the Black Panthers were identified as identified as Black nationalists, but they found that in the United States um, to 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 sort of follow the Leninist model of what a nation is defined by, um, you have to Sort of have a certain dominion over a certain form of land. Um, at that time, in the late '60s, they did not really, they didn't seem to have that. Um, and he, so he said that there needed to be a sort of revolutionary nationalism uh, with different, um, different, uh, varying different nationalities. Um, but again, like this idea of having like a certain form of like physical land dominion. 
um, was lacking in multiple um, forms of what they determined as nations um, because of this idea that imperialism, US imperialism is so overwhelming, it, 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 it controls for the most part the entire world um, in, in the West. I, I, I guess you would, you, you know who I'm like where I'm talking about, I guess. There's obviously um, workers, states that are, resist that. Um, but they, so he developed this idea of intercommunalism where all of these communities need to organize as working, working class subjects and fight US imperialism and US capitalism um, just because that is the stage that we're in. Um, and you saw that acted out, I guess, um, in in Chicago, where Fred, uh, Chairman Fred Ham Hampton organized with the Young Patriots Organization, an organization that was largely, or that was created um, out of Appalachian economic refugees who came to uh, Uptown Chicago, uh, the, the neighborhood of Uptown Chicago, seeking economic opportunity, but in many ways they face the same issues as um, black and brown poor folks in Chicago. I mean, there was issues of landlords evicting or raising their rent um, arbitrarily, um, police brutality and killings on uh, like of young, even white poor um, Appalachians um, and lack of healthcare, lack of education so um, Fred Hampton, along with um, Bob Lee, went into these communities and helped organize in the name of anti-capitalism, socialism. Um, I think Bob Lee even said that the, the term rainbow, uh, the Rainbow Coalition was just code word for class struggle. Um, so these are all obviously like it, it makes common sense to a Marxist when you're thinking dialectically, when you're thinking about how the working class works in this country. But I think for the people who are not, I guess, in touch with that, if they spend too much time in the, in the library or at their, like in the university um, and all they've ever heard by like the mainstream media is you shouldn't talk about class, you should talk about racial divisions, you should talk about like gender divisions, all this, uh, it, it starts to get into like a highly critical or deconstructive um, analysis that kind of doesn't formulate a sort of constructive way forward. Um, I just want to add as someone who lived in Uptown Chicago for like five years, um, not a whole lot has changed in, in the neighborhood. Um, a lot of gentrification has happened um, and a lot of poor people are getting pushed out of, of the neighborhood. Um, the police come and they harass homeless people there and, um, and the alderman is this like cop loving gay man and he's a piece of shit and um, and like it, it, living, living in Uptown was like a huge awakening for me um, on some of these topics because um, most of the people under the bridges I, I saw homeless were, were white. And I, you know, there's most of the social work that happens in Chicago um, happens in Uptown. Um, and the building where a lot of the, so like one of the buildings where a bunch of social work happens happen um it's getting sold and so so that's when i like realized like one of the biggest um like that gentrification isn't just like about white people or like it, it's it's about property ownership like who owns the property mm -hmm. and that's like directly like linked with like the anti-colonial struggle um like how like what does what does land back mean to like, what are they? What are they saying when when they say land back? Are they advocating for like public housing? Are they like no? They're they like, I mean, I'm sure they would, but they don't see that as like, I live here, 
I live in this neighborhood and, and I, I've lived in Illinois my whole life. Where am I going to go? I don't have citizenship anywhere else. Like, like, just say you want to deport all the white people, you know? Well, like, and I just, I wonder what land back means to, like, the tens of millions of homeless people in this country yeah. who you would identify yeah. as settlers, right? How do they give land back that they don't even... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, exactly. they're already they're exactly. already deported every day it's, off of the street. It's terrible story. It sounds like, well, if instead of having white landlords, we had American Indian landlords, it would be okay, because that's the logic of land back. That's where it would leave you. So okay, we'll get rid of all the white landlords in New York, and we'll have the Lenape Indians come back from Oklahoma and be the landlords in New York, and everything will be all right. Nothing will change. We'll still have slum tenements. We'll still have people paying a thousand dollars a month to live in a cellar, but the race of landlords is different. So it's justice. And that's the way it sounds to me. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like to me. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's it's so frustrating because it doesn't make any sense. It, <laughs> are you a socialist or are you not a socialist? What like- Well, and you... I, I mean, I get like, I think that what people really want is like to, kind of talk more about perhaps like indigenous issues in this country and that's I mean that's not contrary to what we I think strive to do I think what we want to do is make it like a materialist analysis because when you say land back in many ways it mystifies what like poor and working indigenous people deal with on a daily basis in the I mean from the beginning of the throughout most of the 20th century and at probably onwards into contemporary uh, there's an issue of um, government-sponsored abduction of children there's currently um, issues of missing and murdered indigenous women there's access to clean water clean or like um, like it's, people are struggling in food deserts lack of jobs lack of any sort of economic opportunity but as Adolf Reed kind of says that these things that you wanna fight for, these sort of um, reforms into the system where you wanna be able to provide jobs, healthcare, what you name it, it, it's, it seems pretty impossible to guarantee these things without including all of the working class. So why not just do that because people would be for it and we should unite people. <laughs> we shouldn't sort of say, well, these people need this and yada, yada. And none it, of these people, it, like I, I, I've i heard, at least the people I know who talk like this, like they don't know any indigenous people. Yeah. They don't know any indigenous organizers in, in, in Chicago, like, or anywhere else they live in the world. Uh, so they're just like, speaking for them and instead of working with them too i think that's a problem like i and i don't know any indigenous person who talks like this either maybe that's just my bubble but and from the way they talk about indigenous people it's in this very mystified way like they're these timeless noble savages well, I, I got in this twitter debate about that question and people would tell me, well, indigenous people don't have a concept of land ownership. It's like, okay, talk to the CEO of a casino on an Indian reservation. Talk to the CEO of the Hard Rock Cafe. That casino chain is owned by Seminole Indians. Ask those people, ask those men, do they believe in private property? Well, if you're the CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation like the Hard Rock Cafe, hell yeah, you believe in private property. So there's none of this, well, because they're indigenous, they have, don't believe in land ownership. Yeah, sure you're right. Spoken like someone who's never had a conversation with an American Indian person in real life. It just sounds like balkanization and, who, and guess who that benefits? Capitalists, imperialists. Okay. Um, Dakota, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think this conversation is part of a larger conversation of why we need a socialism rooted in the United States, because I think the most successful variants of socialism around the world have been variants suited to the people, the culture, 
the language, et cetera, of that particular country. If you look at China, if you look at India, if you look at Venezuela, Cuba, all these different countries have different forms, you know, which all have basic tenets, but are all, you know, suited to their own material needs and where they are in history, where they are in geopolitical scene, et cetera. And I also think it's important to be um, less idealistic. You know, you can open up any work of Marx or any work of Lenin and you can say, well, it says right here, this needs to happen on this date and this is how it's done. But things don't really work like that. You sometimes things change, you know, in Argentina, like under Perón, the communist party, when Che Guevara died, um, the Communist Party denounced him saying he was an adventurist and a settler and all this different stuff. But it was Perón, a non-communist um, figure that said, you know, long live the flag of socialism, no matter what flag it flies, all that different stuff. So a lot of the times you see these traditional actors kind of counteracting what they're trying to do. You know, that's why I think a socialism of the 21st century is very much needed. You know, you need to be pragmatic but you also need to be um creative and you also need to have an open mind you know i i'm a firm believer that socialism in the united states if it's going to take on any sort of power if we actually want a chance at winning any sort of power um which i think should be the goal you know we shouldn't be professional activists for the rest of our lives we should aim to try to achieve some sort of power so we can really change uh the day-to-day -day life of working people in this country. I think that's the most important thing. And I think we lose sight of that because it is so far-fetched, but at the same time, it's so far-fetched because we don't we don't think about what we do in power, et cetera, et cetera, how to actually achieve real power. I, I'm a firm believer that if it is to take place in the United States, it will be a populist socialism. There will be an element of populism, whether that's pop, you know, and Populism is used all the time, 100% incorrectly. You know, if you look at Trump, for example, Trump is indeed, he uses populist rhetoric, but what does that mean? You know, he was using methods that the left should be using. He said he wanted to make the Republican party a quote unquote workers party. When is the last time anyone, you know, it's become so disconnected on the quote unquote left in this country to actually talk about the workers. Um, but instead we talk about every single thing besides class, which is probably the most important thing for most of the people in this country and the thing that is going to unite people to actually fight against the establishment. So if you, and even if you look at most recent incarnations of socialism, you know, revolutions or democratic socialisms, et cetera, that have come into power over the past 20 years, they've all used a form of populism whether it was Venezuela or Ecuador, Bolivia, Cuba. Um, even in Europe, they've had a resurgence of left-wing populist parties which have been able to gain ground. Um, unlike, you know, if you look at Spain, for example, Spain has Podemos, Unidos Podemos, you know, a left-wing populist party. And at the same time, you have not seen an explosion of right-wing xenophobic populism as you have in much of the rest of the United Kingdom or I'm sorry, in the rest of Europe, excuse me. Um, perhaps that's because there's a left-wing alternative. And that's very, um, you know, perhaps all these workers wouldn't be going to Trump, wouldn't be going to that camp if there was a real left-wing alternative. The, my big criticism, one of my big criticisms of the quote unquote left in this country is that they, they don't care about reaching the masses. They care about reaching each other and they care about, you know, having the, loudest megaphone in the protest cage, mm -hmm. as far away connected from the masses, as far away connected from actually educating people about how to make their lives better through socialism. Um, and, you know, I mean, let, let's, let's be real, you know, you pick a communist or socialist party or, 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 you know, most of them in this country have been around for decades. And what do they, what do they have to show? Literally nothing. Um, and, you know, they, talk endlessly about everything besides class. They talk endlessly about things that simply, the, it's not a rallying cry for most workers, no matter their color, no matter their sexuality, et cetera. So that's why I think we need an infusion of populism in the left in order to actually gain any sort of momentum in this country. And even like in the United Kingdom, you see the Workers' Party of Great Britain, um, 
which is gaining some traction. A couple, they have, I believe, 10,000 members, which there's there's no left-wing organization at all in this country that has 10,000 members, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it's, it, it's, we need a 21st century socialism. This is something Hugo Chavez talked about all the time. And this is something that I think will have to be our own creation, but we can take examples from other countries and apply them accordingly. But at the end of the day, you are not going to win over the, you know, 200 million Americans in this country by telling them you have it too good. Um, no, no movement has ever won in a country on a platform of hating that country so much. <laughs> you know, we're not going to get everywhere if we get up and say, decolonize this place, fuck the USA and burn a flag. I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Regardless of what you think, it will not happen. Um, and it hasn't happened. They've been trying to do that for a very long time. So the point is, why are we better for this country than the establishment, than Republicans, than Democrats, than liberals, than conservatives? Because we're for the workers. And that's, at the end of the day, what it has to do. Well, and I think to that point about, like, you can't run on being anti, you have to be pro worker. you can't be anti the nation, I guess. And I think that that's something that I've been sort of thinking about with, I guess, this idea of like revolutionary nationalism and how we've been fed, I guess, an idea of like bourgeois nationalism in the United States. I mean, a lot of people, like, I would say that most people that grew up in the 20th century, in the 20th century did not talk about like class. It was improper to talk about like anything other than like, oh, like, what do you do? Like, other than that, you can't say like, oh, my my boss was like was stealing my wages, blah, blah, blah. It, like, there's a certain culture that has been indoctrinated into the United States that is a bourgeois form of nationalism. But in, in a way, you can't reject the fact that um, black and brown Americans have, and, and working class white people have a sort of shared form of culture anyway like there, there is a working class culture in this in the united states um and it does run contrary to like what you would see in i guess the, the coastal elite areas um and i'm i'm interested to see how working parties that re- re- claim to represent the workers engage with that because i think that you're always going to come into an issue if you have this sort of anti-americanist like um, angle when you can't just you would have to 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 sort of destroy Americanism and then sort of formulate this new whatever like it, it makes it it's not only they not only do they admit that they don't know what they're talking about it just doesn't it it logistically doesn't make sense to be against something that is so popular and unite so many people. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people of color in the United States identify as patriotic. They have flags up on there. Like it, they, they may carry like the Dominican or the Puerto Rican flag, but the United States flag is also like in, in these neighborhoods. Like you go, you go to any, any like urban area that has like a large amount of um, Caribbean, Central American, you see just as many like US flags, because I think I think people still want to be a part of this sort of American ideal or whatever. And while we know that there's a lot of issues and contradictions with that, that doesn't mean that workers can't strive to fight for that ideal or like a material benefits that aim us closer to an ideal of that. Yeah, and also I think in, you know, any socialist project or movement, the um, the idea that it wouldn't um, highlight or center uh, self-determination um, at all is ridiculous. I think a lot of people in that, uh, you know, southern crowd like to assume that that wouldn't be um, the case. And I think that's just really um, misguided and, and they don't really understand what socialism is about. And I think yeah. people like William Z. Foster 
um, have pointed out um, that you know uh, it's up to it's up to uh, that population to decide if they want to secede and have their own nation. Um, but that's up to them, and I think that would be really um, important and center in a socialist project here in the U.S. I'm sure I'm I th I'm thinking of how like in Latin America like most socialist projects have never thought to like change the flag at all I think like the like maybe I think Fidel may have changed tint of blue I maybe Dakota knows <laughs> but it's like they didn't change the actual flag they changed it like a little bit so I'm I'm curious of how it like if the U.S. just kept the flag but like changed like the color like the red to like a little darker <laughs> I know for the Venezuelan flag, they have a horse on it and they, it was facing right and then they changed it to facing left. <laughs> yeah. To add that I think it is a really, um, I think the intention of the settlers discourse, whether people know it or not, is to derail the conversation about what socialism is. To, if, if capitalism is about buying and selling other people's land, then socialism is about giving it back. It's about giving uh, back autonomy to people to have more control over their lives. To argue that it's anything but that, I think is, is wrong. It's anti-socialist, it's anti-Marxist. Like I don't, I, I'm not following their, their logic here. Like, like if, you, if you don't already assume or equate those type of talking points with, with socialism, I don't think you understand what socialism is. And that, like these, these topics are just, they're just distractions and, and people keep falling for this shit all the time. Um, they keep falling for imperialist propaganda. Um, so I, I hope that um, Dakota can shed some light on, on some of these issues in, in Venezuela now. Thanks for letting me pop off for a second. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, Dakota, I, I think we should turn toward Latin America, specifically Venezuela. Um, so tell us about how Venezuela uh, and how their economic policies benefit the masses and the economic war uh, they're facing there and why all of this is important for all workers of the world, but especially in the US. So it wasn't until uh, 2005 that Hugo Chavez said that the Bolivarian revolution, the process that brought him to power uh, was a socialist process, similar to how in Cuba, the Cuban revolution of Fidel and Che wasn't socialist until a couple of years after the revolution actually had gained power. Um, and but before there was already some seedlings that were um, that were planted in that Hugo Chavez when they had a constituent assembly to make a new constitution um, they established that Venezuela was a quote social state of justice and that supreme happiness is the goal of the state et cetera et cetera things that are very socialist in nature but you couldn't really talk about especially in the 90s and the early 2000s because of the fall of uh, the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union, etc. So some of the things that some of the things that they did was Hugo Chavez in the Bolivarian Revolution, his party, they took oil ownership, they made sure they kicked out foreign oil companies, and they started using these royalties and this revenue for the people. They started using their natural resources to benefit the people, they used it to eradicate illiteracy by 2005. Um, they used it to build homes, to diversify the economy. Uh, GDP during Hugo Chavez's presidencies from 1999 to 2013 had a huge growth. The economy was exploding, but at the same time, the economy was exploding with included inclusion. You know, people were able to eat more, people had better wages, people had more employment, you know, things that while the economy may continue to grow in the United States, for example, we are not feeling that growth. Um, meanwhile, in Venezuela and a lot of other countries in South America, at this time they did. Um, 
So Vene the, even things like the labor law that they passed was very um, revolutionary in that it set up workers' tribunals to determine whether or not firing was legitimate, um, stricter um, penalties for wage theft and things like that, strengthening unions, strengthening communal councils, a lot of different things, nationalizing cement production and many other different strategic industries. Uh, worker-owned cooperative, cooperatives, um, government-owned um, subsidiaries. It's very important to note that in Venezuela, in Bolivarian socialism, the concept of private property is not, it's not opposed if the private property is subordinate to the common good, if it's subordinate to the constitution. Um, they recognize three types of property, state property, um, social property and private property. Uh, social property obviously being the most direct where workers themselves control or own it. State property being where you, you know, the state owns it, but the um, surplus value or the revenue is again fed back into the common good and private, you know, perhaps for a profit, but with the social component, the social element. Some things were passed like banking. Banks had to put aside a certain amount of their reserves in order to fund local expenditures. Um, workers had to make up certain amounts of uh, councils and shareholders and things like that. A lot of things that really revolutionized the economy and for a while, and for a while it grew exponentially. These were things that were great for the economy, great for the workers, wages, poverty, uh, all social indicators were going in the right direction. And to this day, they still are but obviously they're being faced down by the most powerful empire in the history of the world, simply because they want to um, go against the oligarchy, the international oligarchy, because they wanna go against capitalism. Um, so we've seen things like the oil price war, which really intensified after 2013, you know, the, the United States and perhaps its allies in Saudi Arabia uh, flooded the international market with oil in doing so causing the price of oil internationally to crash. So, you know, when your state goes from getting, you know, $500 a second to $5 a second or something like that, you're going to feel that crunch to induced inflation where people in the United States would set um, parallel inflation rates causing the devaluation of currency in Venezuela. Uh, you see planned shortages of large corporations and large conglomerates hoarding food and other basic necessities, warehouses full of them um, being discovered every single day. You see, you know, a multi-pronged war. And then of course you have even more terrible is the sanctions. You have sanctions, you have unilateral coercive measures um, which are causing uh, Venezuela, many countries and many companies to refuse to do business with Venezuela to causes even things as simple as insurance on their ships uh, to skyrocket, which when you're already bleeding because of the other sanctions, that's even more of a crunch on the public purse. You know, you see different imports attack, et cetera, et cetera. It's a multi-pronged war. And even in the context of this, Venezuela still remains the most equal country in all of Latin America, except for Cuba. Um, Venezuela still has been able to provide in recent years, they recently hit 3.3 million homes provided uh, for almost completely free to the Venezuelan people. Uh, almost 100% school matriculation for um, K through 12 students. Still continue, they have not closed one university, which is still completely free. Uh, and if you compare this to places like in Europe where faced with similar circumstances, they have done austerity, they've cut spending, they've completely decimated the public sector and destroyed the livelihoods of millions of people that hasn't happened in Venezuela. What you are seeing is times have gotten harder, absolutely, but you see a state that is resisting, you see a people that is resisting, you see crowds that still come out to vote, you see crowds that still come out to defend their country, and the revolution is very much alive. Absolutely. Um, so when, when all this stuff was happening with like the sanctions and the economy starting to crash there because of the sanctions, something um, I would get a lot of feedback on is um, like people leaving the country mm -hmm. and and somebody somebody said well 
if all these bad things are not happening, why are so many people leaving the country then? And, you know, I didn't have an answer for that. And I really, I still don't, but I can't imagine that like when the Imperial Corps tries to shut your country down, that it's, you know, you know, not, <laughs> if it's hard for you to do business because you live in your country, you would have to go somewhere else, right? Like that's what makes sense to me, but maybe you could speak on that a little bit more. So when it comes to the issue of migration, it's a very strange case in Venezuela in that the vast majority of people who have left in recent years have college degrees provided to them by either the private sector or the you know, free public education in Venezuela. Um, also, I mean, let's be honest, millions of people le leaving in a country of 30 million people, that just, it doesn't make sense. Like, I, I will be the first to admit, like, people have left as is customary. I mean, look at all the people that left Eastern Europe. Look at all the people that continue mm -hmm. to leave Eastern Europe because of the continuing effects of neoliberalism, the continuing effects of um, uh, shock doctrine capitalism. You know, it's so, and not only that, but Colombia, which is right over the border, has one of the largest internally displaced populations in the world. There are millions of people because of war, because of narco militaries, militaries and things like that. Millions of people. There's 5 million Colombians who live in Venezuela. And when it comes to, they cook the numbers in such a way that, I mean, they share hundreds of miles of border. So every day, some people go over the border to work. They go to school. They go to um, visit family. They go to visit friends. And they count them multiple times. They, you know, people who return the same day, return the same week, return the same month, those people get counted multiple times. They also leave out conveniently the plan um, Vuelve a la Patria, which is sponsored by the Venezuelan government, which pays for people in other countries to return to Venezuela. <laughs> which doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Venezuelan government is real. Why? If you live in Argentina, if you left, if you live in Ecuador and you left, if you live in Brazil, the Venezuelan government will help you get back to Venezuela because they know just how terrible neoliberalism is in these countries and just how terribly capitalism is treating Venezuelan migrants all over the world. I actually have a question for Dakota though. Um, I, I know that in many countries like we saw with like in extinction rebellion sort of like uh -huh. smearing um evo morales like as like anti-indigenous because he like lit lit the amazon fire like on fire or something mm -hmm. um we saw in isn't um, even wrong indigenous though how he's anti-indigenous no yeah oh <laughs> um, and, and um in so stupid know, it's so stupid in the in the eighties, I know that um, that Russell Means of the American Indian Movement, he was actually employed by the CIA to um, point out that the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were anti-indigenous because they were developing land that was, I think, native in some way. Um, um, and I think now they. I've heard similar things in Venezuela. So I'm wondering if you could kind of talk about um, the sort of indigenous condition or whatever you want to call it in Venezuela and how that sort of, um, how does that interact with the state's kind of um, interest in developing the economy and developing infrastructure? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, I mean, this is part of that whole weaponization of identity to kind of smear um, anti-imperialist or anti-capitalist sectors, etc. I mean, it's it's interesting how in Bolivia that I have heard that, but I mean, Bolivia is not like most countries in that something like ninety-three percent of the country is still indigenous. So if anyone gets affected by anything, it's technically affecting the indigenous population. I mean, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, so and then when it comes to like Venezuela, so representation, like I met with. Um, a woman, her name is escaping me right now, but she um, she was a member of the National Constituent Assembly for the indigenous sector because when that uh, assembly was called, a certain percentage of seats in the National Assembly in electoral bodies like that have to be given to indigenous people, um, which is a huge thing, especially in Latin America. Um, so, I mean, I see where people, because I've heard every now and then like, oh, indigenous activists, 
um, imprisoned in Venezuela, blah, 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 things like that. But it's also, it's very interesting that they always, I mean, most people have an inkling of this, but it's usually the media amplifying some sort of um, narrative. So they'll pick like it, it, they don't say anything about the hundreds of thousands of indigenous people who for the first time their language was talked about by a president for the first time a president said i am indigenous for the first time a president said you are respected and you will benefit from the state just as much as anyone else you know so it's and it's also when it comes to environmental concerns like i mean we have to we have to be honest and practical i mean these countries could be 100% fossil fuel dependent and they still wouldn't even make the smallest drop in the bucket when compared to um, Western capitalist countries or even the United States military for that matter. Um, but so when it comes to um, like the indigenous issue and things like that, like when it comes to developing infrastructure when you're a country that has been depleted so much by neoliberalism, by colonialism and all that, you must, you have to grow. And that's just part of the equation. In Venezuela and in Bolivia and in these other countries, I feel as though they've done it in a way that is in partnership. It's an endogenous model that accepts um, indigenous communities and takes them into consideration. As far as I know, I haven't heard of a real world example of highway or anything disrupting indigenous life in Venezuela. I've heard certain narratives that have been amplified because they fit, you know, a certain media narrative against Chavez or against Maduro. Um, but again, they don't talk about any of the things that the indigenous community has for the first time experienced in Venezuela or Bolivia or anywhere else for that matter. Yeah, so we, uh, you know, you, you mean to tell me that they don't engage in this settler discourse that we, we do up here? It's so funny, like, it's just like when I go there, like, they always ask me, like, what is wrong with your left? Where is your left? Why are they so dumb? Like, and I, and I can't give them an answer <laughs> except for I truly don't know. And I've been saying it for years, but, you know, I don't think the you know Ho Chi Minh and Vietnamese soldiers while bombs were falling on them were talking about you know the perplexities of the 83rd gender or <laughs> also I think it's really interesting that um a lot of these settlers people like like I, I I'm noticing there's 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 some some of these settlers crowd they you know have some critical support for Venezuela and Bolivia but others they don't have mm -hmm. any support for these indigenous leaders at all. And yeah. um, I remember going like at it with somebody on Facebook who was from Venezuela, but they were living in Canada. And they, they were like, I like <coughs> specifically remember them using the line about toilet paper against me. And this was several years ago. This was like, wait, this was before coronavirus and before the United States ran out of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, just thought it was so interesting that they've got this massive tattoo of Frida Kahlo on their arm. Ugh, the cognitive and difference. I know, I know. And I was like, you haven't lived in Venezuela for like a decade at least. <laughs> and, no. then it, yeah. and then they're posting like these um, Johanna Hausman videos. I hate that. Oh my <laughs> God, oh my God. I'm blocked by her. <laughs> <laughs> you know her father is? Yeah, like he wrote all the new, like the destructive neoliberal policies that like triggered the Chavista revolution. Like so transparent. Like it's it's good for us, but like they really think they did something there. They yeah. Like and even like so, I remember one day I was at school. I went to school in New York City. This woman walks up to me. And she's like, "Are you Dakota Lily?" I'm like, "Yes." She's like you know, I'm actually Venezuelan and blah, 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 blah. You should actually go there. I was like, one, I've actually been there. Two, she was dressed like head to toe in Gucci. Like her, her outfit could pay, you know, for a, a month's, you know, fucking food supply for most people in the world. Like it, it's just, and they're so, and again, like, I'm not saying all people who have emigrated from Venezuela are super, super wealthy. But you have to take into consideration if all the things that they say are happening are true, 
how is it that they found themselves in the United States? Probably one of the most expensive countries in the world. How is it they found themselves in Canada or even Argentina or any of these other countries? Like you, 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 and again, most of them, keep in mind, most of them have university degrees. So clearly you come from a sort of class, you know, yeah. uh, sector. I mean, it's, and again, that's not like necessarily me attacking you, even though it kind of is, but it's just a matter of fact. Even even more interesting though is like they they'll I would like I remember when Johanna's video came out about what was really happening in Venezuela and people really were like sharing that they they were sharing that video a lot mm -hmm. and talking about the when we were talking about what was going on and she's a white lady yeah houseman <laughs> very very uh, that's well. a German name and you have to like think like how did a bunch of Germans end up in South America yeah like, like that but she was educated in England like she doesn't have an like it's, she's just so detached from like and that's the thing like they'll be like oh I'm actually Venezuelan it's like what about the millions of poor and working class Venezuelans who actually do support the government you don't actually care about them you just want to amplify right. your voice right right mm -hmm. yeah he's a rootless cosmopolitan <laughs> Gregory we haven't heard from you in a minute what have you got to say about all this uh, well, you know, I'm not really that familiar with uh, the ongoing events in Venezuela, so i am actually been listening here and actually learning quite a bit, because I really haven't followed events there since Chavez died, so mm. but it, was, it was very interesting. I think that um, the, I think what we can kind of talk about is like how petty bourgeois ideology sort of kind of paves the way mm. for people that like Joanna Hausman who have no like, like class, there's no issue of like class identification with her. Like we don't associate with Joanne Hausman, yet we're supposed to take her word about the Venezuelan like society, like the Venezuelan government as fact. Um, Does she live in New York? I think probably, <laughs> or Miami. She doesn't go Anna? Yeah. Yeah, she's in New York City. <laughs> Yeah, Again, <laughs> we're settler Venezuelans trying to, <laughs> I think that's so funny. <laughs> I mean, it's very like, and it's interesting because like, even like when it comes to Argentina, like there was a girl in my uh, constitutional law class and she's like, oh, I'm from Argentina. I was like, oh, what do you think of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and, you know, her party and all that stuff. And she's like, oh, you know, she's a corrupt piece of shit, blah, 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 blah. You know, and again, it's like you find yourself in New York City in a $60,000 a year university, um, which the only way I was able to go is because they forgave literally like all of it for me. <laughs> but somehow, you know, like it, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's very big. I mean, it's interesting because if you look at Syrians, uh, for example, Syrians who are in the United States where I'm from in Pennsylvania, there's a huge Syrian population, but a lot of them support Assad. A lot of them mm -hmm. are very big into him because they were able to go abroad because of the policies of um, of the the government. So it's it's kind of paradoxical. So it's interesting in that you know the rich continue to sit from Latin America continue to send their kids abroad, especially to the United States for an education. You know it's you know as um, was said, it's it's a prolifer proliferation of um, petite bourgeoisism, but yeah. No, I totally hear you. I totally hear you. Um, and they, like, the Syrians I know, they don't like American politics at all because, like, they, they didn't cheer when Joe Biden got elected. Joe Biden bombed their country. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it concerns so me. Like, Biden and Trump both did so much. Well, Biden like went so far to like kiss the ass of the Gusanos and the Esqualidos in Miami, and he still freaking lost Florida. Like, yeah. like it's just so stupid to me. Like, whatever. Do you? <laughs> I'm with well, you. And it's it's funny how like they have more leverage to these people than like all of like the left right now <laughs> like, well, I, he, that, he would rather I joe biden would joe biden would rather 
like kiss the ass of all these people in Miami than like say offer two thousand dollars a month because well, the left this demands point, it. My dog has more leverage than most of the quote unquote left. <laughs> <laughs> It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dakota, but you um, recently, just like Trump, got uh, kicked off of, of Twitter, but uh, tell us why that happened. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I, <laughs> you know, I woke up, I went on Twitter and it just said that you were suspended. And there was like a Twitter outage that day. A lot of people got suspended. Um, including like a lot of prominent Venezuelans, including the son of Christina Kirchner in Argentina. So, you know, I wasn't, you know, I thought yeah, I'd be back up. Um, I submitted an appeal, blah, blah, blah. I didn't hear anything for like two months. Finally, they got back and they said, you were suspended for violating the rules with no corresponding like tweet, nothing. So, well, one, well, freaking like, yeah. It's, violating the rules that's like the only reason you suspend people so you say and two where like what did I do <laughs> and it's funny because I I always was very careful in my wording so that things couldn't be misconstrued as violent or this that or the other so that I could because I I mean I've had that Twitter since 2012 I finally hit 2,000 followers and Twitter decided to zuck me so mm -hmm. now I'm back yeah. up to 330. <laughs> I think they were more the Twitter, Facebook Zucks, Twitter Jacks you. Is that his name? Uh, Jack. Yeah. yeah, Twitter Jack and then I hate you. Zuckerberg. It's Facebook. I hate you. So you got Jack. Well, I, I just Twitter. use Zuck as a rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's being cheeky. Cheeky, very cheeky. <laughs> I guess you really can't stop the horny left. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm leaving the chat now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I oh man, no, I'm, I'm gonna stay here. I'm gonna stay because I'm loving this. I think that's a good place to to leave it. Um, I think this was a really great conversation. I appreciate all of you for for joining us. Um, but before we wrap up, let's um, just remind people uh, where they can uh, find your uh, uh, find your work and where they can find you on social media. Okay, well, I'm on Twitter as Gregory A. Butler. I'm on uh, Facebook as Gregory A. Butler. And I'm on, uh, I also have a blog, Gangbox, uh, Gangbox Construction Workers News Service on Blogspot. You can find that. And those are the main three platforms you can find me on. Well, my, um, I'm on Facebook as Dakota Lily. My new Twitter is at Gringo Chavista one. My Instagram is Gringo Chavista. And I think that's about it. But thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed your talks with Caleb. Um, and I hope that I can be on more. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thanks for having all of us. Um, um, on Twitter as at Arbor Eric and um, on Medium at Eric Arbor.com. But um, probably shoot for the Medium right now just because I feel like I'm not, I've been very lazy. I'm in the middle of like job and moving and like job changes and all that. So I haven't been writing that often. So just read old stuff because the Twitter is just shit posting right now. <laughs> well, your shit posting is amazing. Shit so, posting is how we're gonna get people organized. Yes. Yeah. If we just shit post enough. <laughs> we're gonna shit post our way through the revolution. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you all so much. Um, we look forward to uh, catching up with you again soon.